Y'all get ready. Yes, you get ready. This news in the streets. Join us, sentiment, mother T. Breaking news with integrity. So, sir, your friends and your family. It's the lovely T TV show. Bringing you good tea and good vibes. It's the lovely T TV show. Be sure to share, like, and subscribe. Hey, tea sippers. I hope you guys are doing good today. So, we have more breaking news. Another victim has finally stepped forward and she is suing P. Diddy. So like they say, when it rains, it pours. Now, I had heard about her case um, a few months back. And I think at that point, she was just trying to, you know, tell her story to some of the outlets. But now she's hooked up with Gloria Alred and they have now officially filed paperwork against Sean P. Diddy Combs. And there's also an alleged videotape as well. So it's a 26 page court document. I'm not gonna read all 26 pages. Um, the most important stuff starts around page nine. So on the first page of the indictment, um, it has a plaintiff, Sean Combs, Joseph Sherman, Daddy's House Recording, Combs Global, Combs Enterprise, Bad Boy Entertainment Holding, Bad Boy Production Holding, Bad Boy Books Holding, Bad Boy Records LLC, Bad Boy Entertainment LLC, Bad Boy Production LLC, and Organizational Does, 1 through 10. It's very interesting how this bad boy name, it's just, that's not the name you want to use in a case like this. It's definitely proven that moniker of bad boy correctly. And so they're saying that the plaintiff, her name is Thalia Graves. She's represented by Gloria Albred. And they're saying around the summer of 2001, the plaintiff's life was violently knocked off course when the defendants, Sean Combs and Joseph Sherman, viciously raped her at the Bad Boys record studio in New York City. The plaintiff was 25 at the time and dating one of Combs' employees, a relationship that Combs exploited to lure the plaintiff into meeting him and Sherman alone. Once they successfully sequestered the plaintiff, Combs and Sherman gave her a drink, likely laced with a drug that eventually caused her to briefly lose consciousness, and she awoke to find herself bond and restrained. So this is a 26-page document. Um, I'm going to kind of skip around to the meat and potatoes. So when we go down to about page nine, that's where the gist of everything happens. So line 22, they say, Bad Boys Enterprise is a foundation of Combs Wealth and Power. Bad Boys has sold over 500 million records through its lucrative distribution deals with top music companies in the world and has signed acclaimed hip hop and R&B artists, including Notorious B.I.G., Mary J. Blige, Usher. Combs later founded C-E-O-P-C-O-L-L-C, AKA Combs Enterprise, later rebranded to Combs Global to serve as a home of his portfolio of businesses, including his investments in music, fashion, fragrances, beverages, marketing, film, television, and media industry. So I'm going to skip down, um, let's see here, to, I'm going to skip down to line 23. As detailed above, Combs has a long history of violence and abusing and raping women, and there have been several civil lawsuits filed against Combs in the past year alleging sexual violence and abuse. On September 16th of 2024, Combs was arrested and charged with racketeering and sex trafficking. He was denied bail. Defendant Sherman, also known as Big Joe, was employed by Combs as his bodyguard and head of security during the relevant time period described herein and served within various roles of the Combs corporations. Again, this is how they're able to tie all this into a RICO because he owns all of these entities and a lot of these people who worked under him were also doing dirt as well. Hence the RICO case that he's tied in. So then they go on to say this, Sherman is also a founder of Rhymes and Dimes Magazine, Inc., a New York State registered corporation through or in connection with that company produces and distributes pornography. On information and belief, he has often distributed videos of his or his friend's sexual assaults through his pornography company. So basically, this is a man that deals in pornographic images and video. And so when they want to record pornography or some of these freak-offs, he's the man with the camera. 
Don't forget that. So they go on to say this. The plaintiff met the defendant Combs in and around late 1999 through 2000 through her then boyfriend who was an executive at Bad Boy. In addition to working together, the plaintiff's boyfriend and Combs had a close personal relationship. Plaintiff frequently visited her boyfriend at the Bad Boy Studios in New York City and, and attended events hosted at Combs' residence. Over time, the plaintiff became familiar with Combs and knew about her relationship with her boyfriend. In or around the summer of 2001, plaintiff received a call from Combs concerning her boyfriend's employment at Bad Boy. He told her that he wanted to meet with her in person to discuss her boyfriend's supposed performance issues. Her boyfriend was determined to climb up the ladder at Combs' record label and his romantic partner, the plaintiff, was committed to helping him. The plaintiff agreed to meet with Combs. In retrospect, it was evidently a sick and twisted way of using his ownership of the title at Bad Boy and its affiliate entity to abuse the plaintiff and also show his power and ability to humiliate her boyfriend, his executive. A few hours later, Combs arrived at the plaintiff's mother's residence in Queens with Sherman, who was employed by Combs as his bodyguard at the time. Sherman was driving an SUV and Combs was in the back seat. After the plaintiff entered the vehicle, Combs offered her a glass of wine, which she accepted. Combs began discussing his alleged concerns about her boyfriend's performance at work. Meanwhile, as the plaintiff drank what had been handed to her, she started to feel lightheaded, dizzy, and physically weak. In retrospect, it is clear that Combs had caused a drug to be put into the plaintiff's drink, as a few sips of wine have never impacted her in that way. Combs and Sherman drove the plaintiff to the Bad Boy studio in Manhattan. When they arrived and the plaintiff tried to get out of the car, she realized she was feeling odd and found it difficult to walk. She assumed that this was her fault and did her best to act normal and followed Combs as he led her eventually to a couch in a private room in the Bad Boy studios. She later came to understand that this was Combs' personal lounge and office at the Bad Boy studio. Combs sat on the couch next to the plaintiff and continued to speak to her. Plaintiff began feeling even more woozy and sedated. She then lost consciousness. When the plaintiff regained consciousness, she was naked and her hands were tied behind her back with what felt like plastic grocery bags. The plaintiff shouted for help. In response, Sherman lifted her up from the couch and forcefully slammed her face down on what appeared to be a pool table. Shortly thereafter, Combs entered the room naked. Combs reached for a container of lubricant that smelled like menthol and proceeded to apply it to his penis. Oh my gosh, menthol burns. Menthol is like a peppermint, what the hell? He then bent the plaintiff over on the table, causing her feet to dangle above the floor and forcefully held her down and anally penetrated her without her consent. Oh my gosh. The plaintiff is four foot 11 and weighed only 103 pounds at the time. Oh man. The plaintiff was unable to move and totally overpowered physically, in addition to being drugged and bound. The plaintiff screamed out in pain, but Combs continued to violently, anally rape her. He easily physically overpowered her, smashing her head down on the pool table while she fruitily tried to wiggle out from under him. During the brutal attack, the plaintiff vomited in her mouth on the table. At one point, she involuntarily defecated. Combs was undeterred. He wiped himself off, applied more lubricant without any acknowledgement of the plaintiff's distress, and then proceeded to vaginally penetrate the plaintiff. I did not know this was going to be so brutal, and this is disgusting. So this man put menthol on his penis, which is a burning agent, I don't even know how you can deal with putting something like that on your penis. Then you take an agent like menthol, which burns the skin, and you shove it into somebody's anus and violently rape her to the point where she defecates on herself. It doesn't bother him. The smell of shit and all that stuff does not bother him. He simply just wipes himself off and then proceeds to add more lubricant to his peen, rape her vaginally. Knowing that there's still fecal matter on his penis, now he's pushing all of that fecal matter into her vagina. This man is sick. This is sick. 
Then they go on to say, the plaintiff experienced an intense pain and burning sensation in her vagina and anus. The plaintiff continued to scream for help because of the extreme pain that she felt as combs penetrated her over and over again. She lost consciousness again. The next time she regained consciousness, the plaintiff was on the couch and Sherman was standing in front of her with his bare penis in her face. Sherman slapped the plaintiff in the face and forcefully inserted his penis into her mouth. Sherman slapped her yet again and continued to thrust his penis into the plaintiff's mouth. The plaintiff once again lost consciousness. When she next woke, the plaintiff was on the couch naked and alone in the room. The plaintiff was in severe pain and distress. Her anus and vaginal area burnt. Her face and wrists were bruised and her genitalia smelled strongly of menthol. Oh my gosh. She felt a liquid, presumably semen, dripping from inside her. Her dress was thrown over her and her purse was on the couch next to her and her bra was on the floor nearby. She did not see her underpants. Terrified that Combs and Sherman would return, the plaintiff quickly got dressed and bolted out of the studio room where she had been raped. Still dizzy and weak, the plaintiff called a delivery driver that her family regularly hired and knew well. The driver picked her up from outside the bad boy studio. She was disheveled and crying uncontrollably and suffering from agonizing pain. The driver drove her to the hospital and tried to convince her to report the rape and get a rape kit. But she was unable to leave the car, shaking and crying hysterically and terrified of what Combs would do to her and her family if she reported him. The aftermath and impact of the rape on the plaintiff. The plaintiff sustained serious physical injuries in the, after, in the aftermath of the rape. As noted, she was burning in her vagina and anus and bruising on her wrist and face. In the days after the assault, she suffered prolonged anal bleeding and hemorrhoids. Because of Combs' power and notoriety, the plaintiff was afraid to report what had happened. She was involved in a contentious divorce and custody battle at the time and feared that reporting the rape would cause her to lose custody of her young child. The plaintiff confided in her boyfriend, Combs' employee, hoping he would comfort and support her. But instead of supporting her, he discouraged her from disclosing the assault and telling her that it would negatively impact his own career. What a trash ass boyfriend. Your boss raped your girlfriend and you're worried more about the impact of your own career? What a selfish asshole. <sighs> Let me breathe. Following the assault and multiple times over the years, both Combs and Sherman contacted the plaintiff and warned her to be silent. Threatening repercussions, including the plaintiff potentially, potentially losing custody of her son if she ever disclosed the assault. Because of their enormous power in the industry, including through their ownership and possessions at Combs Corporations, the plaintiff knew that they could follow through on their, threat, on their threats. Plaintiff told close friends that Combs and Sherman had drugged and savagely raped her, but as noted, was afraid to report the attack to the police out of fear that the defendants would follow through with their threats. She was even afraid to stay in New York City while Combs lived there. So with the help of a friend, she fled to Pennsylvania. The plaintiff has in fact relocated multiple times throughout the years in an effort to stay away from Combs. The plaintiff has suffered irreparable harm because of the brutal rape by the defendants, Combs and Sherman. She suffers from severe depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. She also suffered from suicidal ideations and intrusive thoughts and has attempted to end her own life. The plaintiff lives in constant fear. She struggles with hypervigilance and experiences anxiety and panic attacks in social settings, preferring to be alone. Her need to hide to feel safe has strained her relationship with friends and family. The defendant's rape has also impacted the plaintiff's ability to engage in sexual acts with intimate partners to this day. She cannot be in certain sexual positions without experiencing flashbacks of Combs violently penetrating her from behind. On around November 27, 2023, all of the trauma of the rape came flooding back to the plaintiff when her former boyfriend revealed to her for the first time that Combs and Sherman had recorded and published the video of the horrific attack. 
Earlier that month, Cassie Ventura had come forward and filed a lawsuit against Combs for subjecting her to years of sev to years of severe sexual and physical abuse. The case had been settled one day after it had been filed. The plaintiff's former boyfriend invoked Ventura's efforts to hold Combs accountable and for the first time confessed that years earlier, but sometime after the actual rape itself, Sherman and Combs had showed him and a group of men some of whom were also employed by Combs companies and their related entities, the videos of the plaintiff being raped. He disclosed that Combs and Sherman had a pattern and practice of non-consensually recording women, engaging in sexual acts, and making videos available to the public, including by selling tapes as pornography. Now, what's very interesting about this situation with Diddy and Big Joe, if you guys remember, back in the day, 50 Cent did an interview with Shade 4 or 5 with DJ Who Kid. And during that interview, this was like back in like 2010, he stated that he saw a video, a sex tape with Cassie on it. So these men never stopped their antics, even in 2010 and beyond, because her situation took place in 2001. He was recording Cassie and sharing her videos with people in the industry. Let me go ahead and refresh y'all's memory real quick. So I mean, he tell, he'll tell you himself what happened in Miami, stay in Miami. Oh, oh my God. So you think... And and the nigga be like... Matter of fact, they send me the girl pictures. Like, pictures of this girl, like... Not the shit that y'all saw. Worse. Way worse. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Are you kidding me, yo? Like, penetration pictures and... and nah, come on, man. <laughs> come on, Phil. All that, and I didn't even, I didn't even, I called the nigga, I said, yo, you really, you fucking with this girl, like, you really, like, you like her, like that? And he was like, yeah, that's, that's my girl. I'm like, all right, I'm going to send you something. You look at it, you call me back. Oh, I man. sent him the photos, the pictures and everything, and the nigga called back and was like, yo, thanks, man, about us tonight, yo, I really appreciate that. Yo, where you get these shit from? <laughs> and I said, you know, like, because they know, like, if something crazy is going on, if they send it to me, I'm a, I'll make sure it get out there. Like, as far as this video com is concerned. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and those other properties. So, they sent it to me. <laughs> but, you know, I really, I really kind of felt like those photographs were not happening because of Cassie. I felt like they was happening because of Puffy. Right, right. Oh, wow. You know what I'm saying? Because when a, a girl moved from a man and she upgraded... Niggas be insecure, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> they start feeling some kind of way, especially like, like whoever last, whoever the guy was she was with in the photos versus where Puffy's at. Because Puffy, he ain't no slouch, nigga, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, he's been able to take advantage of all the suckers. So all right, so you guys just heard that clip. I'm going to go back to reading the document now. A bad boy artist later corroborated in a text message that Sherman used to sell porn of him doing this to chicks and that Sherman did that to a lot of women. Plaintiff's former boyfriend reported that he and other men watched the recording of the plaintiff's rape on a handheld camera while at the bad boy studio in New York, in New York City. Combs, Sherman, and some of the other men made derogatory comments about the former boyfriend's relationship with the plaintiff in an attempt to shame him into cutting ties with the plaintiff and to cause her further emotional harm and embarrassment. On information and belief, the defendants continued to show the videotape of the rape to others over the years and throughout the present and or sold the video as pornography. The plaintiff was shocked and horrified that Combs and Sherman had recorded and publicized the video of them raping her over two decades spent trying to heal and distance herself from the experience, the plaintiff was devastated by this news. She felt that her life has been turned upside down again and like the rape had been happening again and again, even as she tried to forget it. She experienced acute psychological distress, plunging into a deep depression and having suicidal ideations. She felt intense fear, anger, and anxiety. The plaintiff lives with the distress of knowing that the video of her brutal rape is in circulation that anyone, including her family, friends, peers, could view it at any time. In a panic, she reached out to Sherman after learning about the tapes, hoping to protect herself from further humiliation by convincing him to destroy the tape or provide it to her, but he did not respond. 
Combs' pattern and practice of violence and abuse, including drugging, raping, and secretly recording his violence against women. Combs has a long history of violence and abuse. Long-standing behavior has been enabled by his ownership and of the titles of Combs Corporation and their affiliated entities and the immense wealth and power he has amassed through such business dealings. Among a long list of allegations, in 1996, he was found guilty of criminal mischief for threatening a photographer from the New York Post with, the, with a gun. In 1999, he was arrested and charged with second-degree assault and criminal mischief in connection with the beating of a record executive and arrested again the same year in relations to the shooting at a club in New York that a female victim who consistently stated that Combs shot her in the face at point-blank range. Combs has also has a pattern and practice of using power and influence in the music and entertainment industries to submit people to his sexual violence, often drugging them, his victims, and or coercing them to consume drugs and recording the assaults, often without the victim's knowledge, just as he did with the plaintiff. In the past year, a number of these people have come forward to accuse Combs of sexual assault, violent rapes, and or trafficking. So that's basically the gist of everything that happened. This entire situation is extremely disturbing. Like I said, it's 26 pages long, um, but I basically read the meat and potatoes of it. So now uh, Miss Thalia Graves is speaking out. So that's basically the gist of everything that happened. This entire situation is extremely disturbing. Like I said, it's 26 pages long, um, but I basically read the meat and potatoes of it. So now uh, Miss Thalia Graves is speaking out and she's sharing her story with her attorney, Gloria Alred. And you can tell this woman is still traumatized. Like she can barely talk. She's crying. The whole thing is just extremely disturbing. So I want you guys to go ahead and check this out. Thank you for coming today. I'm attorney Gloria Allred. And with me is our client, plaintiff Thalia Graves. Today we filed a lawsuit in the United States District Court, Southern District of New York, for our client, Plaintiff Thalia Graves, who is given permission to use her name. The case number of the 26-page complaint is 1 colon 24 hyphen CV hyphen 07 201. In her lawsuit, Thalia, through her attorneys, sues Sean Diddy Combs, also known as the defendant, and another individual and other entities. The complaint alleges in part in the first cause of action that defendant Combs and another defendant committed a, quote, violation of New York City Victims of Gender Motivated Violence Protection Act by viciously and violently forcing sexual contact, oral sex, and sexual intercourse on the plaintiff, end quote. In addition, the complaint alleges in the second cause of action that defendant Combs and another defendant committed a violation of New York civil rights law, quote, section 52 hyphen B, end quote, by quote, raping plaintiff and recording it. Defendants caused plaintiff to be de depicted in a video image, unclothed and with intimate body parts exposed, and engaged in sexual conduct with another person, end quote. The lawsuit also alleges that, quote, defendant Combs and another defendant published and or disseminated the videos without plaintiff's knowledge or consent. On information and belief, defendants have continued to disseminate the video, including by selling it as pornography through the present, end quote. In our complaint, we ask that, quote, defendants should be ordered to account for and destroy all copies of the video that are in their actual or constructive possession, custody, or control. End quote. And that, quote, defendants should be temporarily and permanently enjoined from further disseminating or publishing any intimate videos of plaintiff, end quote. 
We also allege in the third cause of action that Combs and another defendant committed a violation of New York City Administrative Code, Section 10-180, quote, recording and showing others the video of themselves violently raping the plaintiff. And the defendants disclosed an intimate image of plaintiff without her consent, end quote. As a result of these and other allegations in our complaint, we request that judgment be entered against defendants as follows. Awarding compensatory damages for all physical injuries, emotional distress, psychological harm, anxiety, humiliation, physical and emotional pain and suffering, family and social disruption and other harm in an amount to be determined at trial. Awarding punitive damages in an amount to be determined at trial. Awarding attorney's fees and costs pursuant to any applicable statute or law, including under New York City Administrative <coughs> Code, Section 10-1104, New York Civil Rights Law, Section 52-B2, New York City Administrative Code, Section 10-180, and any other applicable statute or law. We're also seeking additional relief that the court may deem just and proper. As a result of what is alleged in the lawsuit, Thalia alleges that she has suffered and continues to suffer, among other damages, emotional harm, including mental anguish, emotional distress, humiliation, and physical damage. In a few minutes, Thalia will speak to the impact and harm that she has suffered and continues to suffer. She will take this courageous step because she thinks that it is important that the public understand the impact that rape and other criminal acts have on those who have been victimized. Often victims do not speak publicly about the specific damages that criminal acts cause them. Some of the many reasons that victims do not speak out publicly about this include being ashamed or shamed for this. But we believe that victims should not be shamed and instead those who committed the criminal acts against them should be ashamed and take responsibility for the harm that they have caused victims to suffer. We are very proud of Thalia for speaking out today in order to help victims of rape and other acts of sexual violence against them. In addition, we thank our co-counsel Marianne Wang, Heather Gregoria, and Jasley Liriano for their exceptional legal work on this complaint. Our goal for Thalia is very simple. We want justice for her, and we are looking forward to winning it. It is long overdue for those who have caused her to suffer to be held accountable. The internal pain after being sexually assaulted has been incredibly deep and hard to put into words. It goes beyond just physical harm caused by and during the assault. It's a pain that reaches into your very core of who you are and leaving emotional scars that may never fully heal.
some of the hardest parts of this pain are the shame and the guilt. I have experienced that plays a negative part in my day-to-day -day ability to function properly, being blamed, questioned, and threatened has often made me feel worthless, isolated, and sometimes responsible for what happened to me. My family issues made the pain even worse. I was already going through a divorce at the time of the assault and did not get the support that I needed. I was also faced with disbelief and judgment. This has put a strain on my selection of men and relationships. With many relationships became aggressive and abusive, which has made me feel even more alone in my struggles. I go through spells of being distant and withdrawn that it's sometimes so hard to leave my house. The trauma of the assault has taken a toll on my mental health. I've had PTSD, depression, and anxiety. I'm emotionally scarred. It has been hard for me to trust others, to form healthy relationships, or even feel safe in my own skin. Flashbacks, nightmares, and intrusive thoughts make me feel like it's a constant struggle. I also suffer with physical problems such as chronic pain, sexual discomfort, the violation I have experienced during the assault has had lasting effects on my body, causing ongoing health problems and complications. The combination of physical and emotional pain has created a cycle of suffering from which it is so hard to break free. I want to continue on this journey towards recovery and healing. I'm glad that he is locked up, but that's a temporary feeling of relief. <clears throat> Dahlia is not going to be taking any questions, but I'll be happy to take some questions. Laura, can you talk about the, the context of this assault? Uh, what, where, when, what occasion? Question is, can I speak about the context of this alleged assault? No. Gloria, can you just speak on, uh, I know it's difficult for your client going through this, but what prompted her to come forward now? It was time to file this lawsuit. Gloria, what do you know about the video that was allegedly recorded? during the alleged uh, violation. question so, is, what do I know about the video that was recorded? Yeah, what do you know? Where is it now? Is it still... I mean, where is the video? Yeah. Um, there are many details in the complaint. The internal pain after being sexually assaulted has been incredibly deep and hard to put into words. 
it goes beyond just physical harm caused by and during the assault. It's a pain that reaches into your very core of who you are and leaving emotional scars that may never fully heal. Some of the hardest parts of this pain are the shame and the guilt I have experienced that plays a negative part in my day-to-day -day ability to function properly being blamed, questioned, and threatened has often made me feel worthless, isolated, and sometimes responsible for what happened to me. My family issues made the pain even worse. I was already going through a divorce at the time of the assault and did not get the support that I needed. I was also faced with disbelief and judgment. This has put a strain on my selection of men and relationships. But many relationships became aggressive and abusive, which has made me feel even more alone in my struggles. I go through spells of being distant and withdrawn that it's sometimes so hard to leave my house. The trauma of the assault has taken a toll on my mental health I've had PTSD, depression, and anxiety. I'm emotionally scarred. It has been hard for me to trust others, to form healthy relationships, or even feel safe in my own skin. Flashbacks, nightmares, and intrusive thoughts make me feel like it's a constant struggle. I also suffer with physical problems such as chronic pain, sexual discomfort, the violation I have experienced during the assault has had lasting effects on my body causing ongoing health problems and complications. The combination of physical and emotional pain has created a cycle of suffering from which it is so hard to break free. I want to continue on this journey towards recovery and healing. I'm glad that he is locked up but that's a temporary feeling of relief. <clears throat> Dahlia is not going to be taking any questions, but I'll be happy to take some questions. All right, so you guys just saw that video. So I feel super bad for this woman. I did not know that the details of what she went through was that horrible and graphic. So again, to people like Dr. Umar Johnson, who are sitting here trying to act like it's no big deal and Didi's only locked up because, you know, he shouldn't be locked up. Prostitution is legal and, and they're just trying to get him for bringing chicks across state lines. This man is a violent sadist. You just heard what this woman said. They drugged her. He put menthol on his penis. Menthol is a burning agent. He went into this wanting to inflict pain on this woman for no other reason. This was all to embarrass her man. Maybe her man was better looking, had more swag. So I'm going to violate this woman to show 
her man who she, you know, loves and cares about, how I can make him feel less of a man and make her feel like she's worth nothing. This man is a deviant and a demon. I've been saying this for years. If he never sees a light of day again, I could care less. And if you think this is bad, there's more coming down the pipeline. Oh, the floodgates are open. And it's gonna be a mixture of people coming out with not only lawsuits, criminal filings, civil filings. By the time all of this is said and done, he will be completely bankrupt. And he better hope his sons, because they're also accused of sexual assaults, Christian Combs, he better hope his son is not sitting up in that cell next to him or down the hall from him. And the sad part is once again, like I said in my live stream, all of this stuff is learned behavior. So if these boys are engaging in this, the rotten apple doesn't fall far from the rotten ass tree. This entire situation is just sad. My heart goes out to her. So y'all, let's go ahead and get the discussion popping. Let me know your thoughts on this entire situation. Please leave a comment down below. Feel free to share the video. Um, have a good day and I'll talk to you guys later. Bye. If you want the latest news in the streets, join us and tune in for the tea. Breaking news with integrity. So sir, your friends and your family. It's the lovely TV show. Bringing you good tea and good vibes. It's the lovely TV show. Be sure to share, like, and subscribe.